Well, good morning, everyone. Look forward to see what the Lord has in store in this gospel as we get this opportunity to, to preach to all of you from the Word of God, something I do not take lightly. Uh, may the Lord continue to bless us in the reading of His Word as we continue to work with that. We enter into joy with, with Chip and Danielle, with the birth of their, their child, Essie. We pray that everything's going well and that you're being blessed, Pastor. We love you and care for your family. We're so glad that you are here um, bringing the Word to us weekly. We pray uh, that you will continue to grow in the admonition of the Lord and teach this young new child that you've been blessed with about the Lord Jesus Christ and his supremacy in all things. And we will join you in prayer for that. Uh, I appreciate your prayers for me this morning. I had one of the stressful weeks I've had in a long time this week, but uh, I always know that there's rest in God. There is just something about being in his presence that calms us and brings us back to center. So be praying for me as I preach to you today that I would be clear in thought, that I would be able to communicate with you the, the wonderful truth uh, uh, that God has in his word, and that we might stand in awe of him. What a glorious God that we serve, isn't he? He's more and more beautiful to me every year that goes by, every second that goes by. He is just our treasure, and he's provided his word for us to, to learn and to grow and to know more about him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we enter into the book of John uh, and take a look at Jesus' early ministry, the miracles in which he performed, the power in which he spoke, and all for you and me, that we might know him. So Father, we, we ask for your blessing this morning on the reading of your word. Uh, I just pray that you would help us to see your true compassion for your people, that we might learn from your word um, about your true intentions of the law and of the Sabbath, that you might provide for us a way to know you better and to recognize that your son, Jesus Christ, was one with you, that he was your messenger, speaking your word to the people. May our eyes and ears be open to your truth here this morning as we read, read from your powerful, powerful word. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are longing for you, aching for you, that we might know more about you and your supremacy. Father, we thank you for bringing us here together, that your providence has given us the grace to come here this morning and learn more about you. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So I'm continuing on in the book of John, as I've had opportunity to preach and I continue to go through the book of John. But we're in chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And it's the, the healing at the pool on the, on the Sabbath. Uh, um, the sheep of Bethesda, the gate, sheep gate at Bethesda. It's a story that is familiar to us, but we're going to really learn from that today about the compassion of Jesus, the truth of the Sabbath, and Jesus being one with the Father, the full deity of Christ. And we're going to focus on those three points today. So let's take a look at the reading of the word, verses 1 through 18. Follow along with me. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He had been in Galilee performing many miracles and like a, a big follower of all the rules that his father had set forth for, for, Judy, for, the, Judy, for the Jews. He was going up to Jerusalem um, in preparation for the Sabbath. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not law for you, for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had just been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, 
See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father and making himself equal with God. May God bless the reading of his word. I think I was captivated by this because we saw the true compassion of Jesus. Jesus, who had been doing these miracles and had now been heading to Jerusalem to, to go and to, to worship his father and to, to you know, follow what the father had set forth um, as he headed back to Jerusalem, went into a place that he didn't have to go to, but he did. He went to this place called the House of Bethesda, or the place of the five colonnade groups where they had constructed man-made places for people to sit by the pools that they could possibly be healed by the waters. And this was a human um, building that took place right by a spot where miracles had known been happening from time to time. Um, you'll notice that in your ESV that there's no verse 4. Verse 4 was skipped over because the earliest manuscripts did not have it in it. I believe it's in the King James, but there had been this tradition or the idea that an angel had come down to stir the pools, and then the first person to step into the pool would be healed. So they obviously built these structures there for people that were invalids to, to come and to hang around. And from time to time, there would be a miraculous healing in that place. Um, but the earliest manuscripts did not have that idea of an angel stirring the waters, although that might have been the tradition at the time. So we see that that verse is missing. But the idea was the same. This is a place where uh, the religious leaders um, had a, a place for people who were invalids or blind and lame to, to, to be there and to work. And it was called the House of Mercy. And as I think about that name, what a beautiful name that it is, but at the same time, I wonder where these religious leaders were in terms of interacting with these people. They were just sitting there lying in wait to be healed. And who was really ministering to them? They were teaching them the word of God or the exact presence of God. Instead, the religious leaders were pointing out it must have been some sin for you guys to be doing this. So here's a place for you to wait for a miracle. Right? And then we see that a lot of the times within the church or within people. People um, think about how people are acting and what's going on and what might have happened. And they reason about all these things that could happen. And what they really need is they need God. They need Jesus. They need the truth. And what we see here is that um, we're so thankful that the compassion of Jesus is not like the compassion of religious leaders of this time. Jesus did not have to go to that place that day where these people were. He decided to go there and he went there for an intense purpose. And there were lots of people around, but he focused in on the one. The compassion of Jesus is deliberate, it's thoughtful, it's preordained, and it's beautiful. He sees a man that is incredibly in need, one that has been lame 38 years. You and I, can we imagine what that might be like to not be able to move, to be dependent upon somebody all the time. But this fit right into the religious leaders of that day. They wanted people dependent on a system, to be sitting there and wait for their rules and their regulations and their overpowering of what was to be done during that day. For you and I that um, love people and would like to be there, I can't imagine what I would have been like seeing that. I know my own mother in a nursing home, I'd like to talk to everybody that's there because they're just so lonely. And these people must have been there lonely, just waiting for that stirring of the water. And yet there was nobody there to organize it, to help it, to say who would come in. It was everyone fends for themselves. There was no talk of talking to this man about his condition. And Jesus went right to him in a compassionate way and said to him something that is kind of ironic. He'd been there for 38 years, and Jesus saw him lying there, right? And he was there a long time. And the question he asked, do you want to be healed? It's a poignant one, isn't it? Those of you who are sick or just dealing with issues, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be restored? He looks right at the man and asks him something, and the, the man is kind of dumbfounded, right? He's like, but sir, there's no one to help me down in the pool when the waters are stirred up. The man recognized his need, but so did Jesus. Jesus recognized it before he even had it. Do you want to be healed? But nobody can put me down in the pool 
It's stirred up, and while I'm going another steps down, somebody's always cutting in front of me or doing these things, and I cannot move. Moved with compassion, Jesus does not finish the discourse, but just says to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once, the man was healed. Here we see the power of Jesus, the compassionate power of Jesus, to do in half a second what that man was struggling with for 38 years. So careful was he to tell him, and compassionate was he, he tells him, get up your mat and walk. That very mat that had been his serving place, that mat that he had been on, laying in the same place for that period of time. We don't know if he was at the pool for 38 years. We know he was an invalid for that amount of time. And that he had been, for an indeterminate time, was at this top, this place of Bethesda, waiting for healing. I want to know where the religious leaders were in this man's life. And yet Jesus brought to him the truth and said, get up your mat and walk. The compassion of Jesus is um, something that we see in the scriptures many, many times, right? You can't think of the compassion of Jesus without thinking about the, the woman of Samaria. You know, Jesus goes to her and she talks about the well that Abraham had put there, right? And Jesus tells her, um, Jesus says this, um, she just marvels at him. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw the water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of welling water, welling up to eternal life. What a compassionate God to be saying that to her. What's the next thing she says? We see her heart. Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty. And I will not have to come here and draw water. <coughs> Women, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us things. All, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you of me. Wow. Compassionate God, speaking to a person who is in need, tells her that he's going to have water that she'll never have to drink again. She thinks, well, Bob, I won't ever have to come back to this water and pull up well. And no, the compassion of Jesus is teaching, no, it's not about that water in that well. It's not about you drinking for life-sustaining things. This is about everlasting life. She heard of the Messiah to come, and he tells her plainly, I am he. That's what makes her whole. Amen. We focus on the flesh. We focus on that which we think that we need. And Jesus gets right to the point. It's me. I've healed you. In this case of the, the man um, that was paralyzed. This woman um, gained new understanding of what the scriptures were telling her or what Christ was telling her. That we can do that, right? After hearing that, many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know this is indeed the Savior of the world. Beautiful passage, right? Telling us about Jesus' compassion on this woman and the impact that that had. Because it was the truth, and the truth opens our eyes to who Christ is. And when you hear it, your life can be opened up to amazing things because of the work of Christ. We see compassion at work in many ways within our church, um, within our, our world, and we are thankful for that. And we, we see the truth of the scripture being opened to many, many people. And we, we want to go on um, to other acts of compassion 
Um, one of my favorites is in John chapter 9. And in John 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. And the discourse from the, uh, from the Jew Jewish leaders are, who was it that sinned that this man is not able to see? And the, the disciples were asking him as well. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit in the ground and made the mud with the saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said, go to him. Go to wash the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he washed and came back seeking. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to beg? Some said, it is he. Others says, no, but it's a guy like him. He kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And so I washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, again, I tell you, I put, he put mud on my eyes and he told me to go to the pool, right? <laughs> and it's just incredible to me to do this. And he opened my eyes. So the Pharisees asked again how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes. I washed and I see. Um, some of the Pharisees says, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. So here we see a man who has been healed, and he's giving the same answer and over and over again what Jesus has done. And they're thinking other thoughts. He healed on the Sabbath, told you to do works. We want to get him. And yet Jesus' compassion is for this man. And the Jews couldn't believe it, so they actually went to his parents, right? Said, Is this the was your son blind from birth? And they were addicted to the system of religiosity at the time. They knew what the, the, uh, the Pharisees were going to get to them about was, look, he did this on the Sabbath. They wanted no part of breaking the Sabbath. So they said, he's of age. Go talk to him. And again, we see the answer. Again, the second time they went to the man. And he wanted to, they wanted him to verify that Jesus was a sinner. Jesus was this person who told him to do something against the Sabbath. And the reason why I love this story so much, the compassion of Jesus broke through so much to this man that he, in a second, knows more than the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Here's what he says. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He's trying to get them to agree that Jesus was a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Wow. They said to him, What did you do? How did he open your eyes? He answers them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. And we know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Then the man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. And the NIV says, Now this is remarkable. All right? Remarkable. This is amazing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began <laughs> um, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us. And they cast him out. Here we see the compassion of Jesus in the conclusion of this story. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And we see a heart change in this individual. And who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see. Those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees heard him say these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. 
But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Jesus' compassion was not only to tell the Pharisees where they were in their error, but to show the truly needy people of the world who he was, and to open their eyes into the truth. We see the power with which Jesus heals, whether it be the blind man, or whether it be the man who was an invalid for 38 years. We know that it was quick, it was immediate, and he had the very power of God to heal. We see the compassion of Jesus in trying to tell his story about who he is, and try to remind the world that, and even these religious leaders, that everything that they should have known about was now in bodily form in front of them. The incarnate Jesus, the one in whom God went to send through the scriptures, had finally arrived and was ready to take on his ministry. We see the compassion of Jesus that is deep and profound, whether it be the woman at the well, whether it be with this invalid man for 38 years who had nobody to help him, or whether we see it in this blind man, right? And we know that he did it on the Sabbath. And we're going to start talking about that in terms of the Sabbath. The Jews and the religious leaders of that time had done so much to the Sabbath to make it so unrecognizable to God that they just kept on keeping on do's and don'ts. And it began to be them serving the Sabbath instead of serving God. And we tend to want to do that. We tend to want to add to it to make it our own. If we have some of the law, the more must be better. And they added to it daily. And what Jesus wanted to do was to tell them the true meaning of the Sabbath. And we noticed that it wasn't the Jews catching him doing it on the Sabbath. He deliberately went and healed and did things on the Sabbath to call into account their misuse of his father's holy law. And we're going to see that as we go forward. But we have this continual presence of Jesus' compassion. One last story that I, I won't read the whole text to you that I'm just amazed with is you know, another healing that he did was with a withered man, the man with a withered hand, right? The religious leaders were asking if it was lawful on the Sabbath, right? And J Jesus said, unfurl your hand. The compassion of Jesus to just be able to heal and to take on that ministry to do so. And we know that Jesus was going to be put to death on a cross. But what we think is that the Jews did it. And what we're really seeing is Jesus was in complete control of everything that happened up until that time. He ordained his procession unto death by taking on the religious leaders, although he would often slip away, as we saw in this story, after he did the healing. He slipped away for a time because there were many people that were there, that it could percolate and it could start to be set in the minds of the Jews to kill him, to bring him to his death, that we might have the resurrection to life. We see a deep compassion in Jesus. One of my favorite stories of compassion actually happened on a road at Henry Clay Boulevard in Clay, New York, 1991, January 6th, where the Lord opened my eyes to his truth and I stood in worship of the King. Praise the Lord. You too probably have that day of compassion where you just can't believe the amazing compassion of Jesus to reach in your life and pluck, pluck you out of the depths of hell and restore you unto himself. But your eyes were open to the truth of who he was. We see a compassion in Jesus where his word goes forth and never returns void. Jesus was going to take on the religious leaders of that time and really present his truth, that he was the embodiment of what God had done. And as we see this Sabbath that they were trying to protect, the Lord of the Sabbath was right in front of them, and they didn't know it. And they should have known, and he called them into that account. The Sabbath, as I was mentioned, uh, had rules to it, but the whole point of the Sabbath was to give glory to God. And on that day, God rested. Um, and in creation, it was a kind of a significance to that. It wasn't exactly that um, time that the law was given, but that idea where he took that rest. God is never not at work. He is always at work. He stopped his creative powers on that day that he might rest and see that it was good. And in that, he would eventually give us the law in Exodus, and that included the Sabbath. And we're going to take a look at that today. The part where the religious leaders went wrong was they kept on adding to it because there was no work. They began to serve the law and serve the Sabbath in ways that it was not intended. It says in um, Exodus 20, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or the sojourner within your gates. For six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, and the rested on the seventh day. 
Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The whole point of the Sabbath day is the Lord, that we might delight in the Lord, that we might rest from trying to make our lives and our provisions, a day of rest from serving our employees and having your whole families work, to recognize that all your sustenance came from the Lord your God. And this Sabbath day was meant to be holy, but holy for a purpose, holy that we might recognize him. Not serve this archaic law that we think it means, but to recognize that on that day we need to have our focus on God, not on doing things or not doing things or following any regulations, but sitting in awe in the presence of God and having a day dedicated to knowing about him. You're sitting here in the pews now coming to feast on the word of God, to rest in him and him alone. I hope that we are not like that invalid man for 38 years, that we too sit in the pews Hear the word of God and let it have very little impact on our lives because our eyes have not been open to that truth. That we think somehow by coming into church is serving the way that they thought that following the Sabbath means not doing work or not doing this or that. Are we really focusing on the joy of the Lord or do we see coming to church as one of those duties like they did in the law? Do we come complacent? Do our eyes need to be open to the truth that is in Christ Jesus? When God set aside that time for rest, he means to rest in him, not to focus on doing or not doing things. I mean, they added incredible things to that law, the Shabbat or the rules that they have. They can't carry certain things from one place to another. Um, no plowing in a field, starting a fire, restraining from just about everything, every little thing. These rules became cumbersome. But the Sabbath is much greater than that. It says in Exodus 31, 12 through 18, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbath. For this is a sign between you and me and you throughout your generations that you might know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. What's that? I, the Lord, sanctify you. This day was set apart so that we could focus on God, who is our justifier and one who sanctifies us. He is the one that is doing the work. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. Six, day, six days shall the work be done, but the seventh day the Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. We are resting for what purpose? To do or to not do things? Or to rest in the holiness of God and to trust him for all things and to recognize that the Sabbath was never meant to abolish the necessities of life nor the mercy that needed to be extended to his people. And we know that it's a big deal for God because he says that those who do not keep the Sabbath shall be put to death. Because it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord has made the heaven and the earth and the seventh day he was rested and was refreshed. And he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony of the tablets written in stone, written by the very finger of God. What they were really missing is the God of this law, the God of the Ten Commandments. The God that was necessary. And here was God incarnate in Jesus, the one who was going to fulfill all of those things, including the Sabbath. In fact, he was Lord of the Sabbath himself, was now in front of them, ready to bring to them these truths. We think that, and we know that the Jews crucified the Lord under Pontius Pilate, right? That it was Rome who put him to death on the cross. But we see that it would have been impossible unless Jesus had initiated this type of storm that was coming by taking on the Sabbath. This is what put it in our hearts to continue to keep forward. We are to delight in God. We are not to just become strict rule followers and forget the person who gave those rules. The God above all. In the book of Isaiah, we're, we're talked about talks deeply about the delight of God in the Sabbath. Isaiah 58, 13. He's reminding the people, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasures, or talking idly, then you shall delight in the Lord, and I will make you a ride on the heights of the earth, 
I will feed you in the heritage of Jacob, your father, and the mouth of the Lord is spoken. That day is to be an utter delight, not a day of ceaseless burdens that you cannot carry out. It's a day to rest in God and God alone and to talk about his delight. Then we will take delight in the Lord, and I'll make you ride in the heights. So great is our God, so wonderful is his supremacy over us and his um, compassion towards us that he gave us a day to remind us of just how blessed we are in him. Jesus was the fulfillment of that Sabbath. The Sabbath was a shadow of the things to come for Christ to come into the world and take on that we might enter his rest. Imagine that. Isn't that great? We're going to be entering into the rest of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. And we have total access to him now in the Father. Amen. I hope you're resting today. Resting in the truth and the supremacy of God to know that he is with you all the time and anywhere we go. And these religious leaders were more worried about their death grip on the people and their false religion following their codes and conducts for their place, place of privilege. They were in serving the God who had given it to them for his purposes, which is himself. We love the scripture because it tells us that God is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He blessed his people from the very beginning, and they have tried to turn away to anything else but him. And yet, we see his true compassion and continuing to come into the world and to heal people that are needed his help and didn't even know it. The rule has just kept on going, right? We go back to the story where the invalid man was healed. And isn't it amazing to you that this man was healed and for 38 years hadn't moved a lick? And the first thing that they say is, why are you breaking the Sabbath? Ridiculous, right? How are they not marveling at the very work of God that this man who was gone for 38 years, not being able to move, is finally walking and upright? How are they not on their knees worshiping the Lord God for his healing and instead saying you're breaking the rules of the Sabbath. It's preposterous. It makes no sense. If one of you had cancer or had something going on, all of a sudden you're restored and you're whole and you, you, your legs were bound and now you're walking, I'm not going to be asking you something as ridiculous as why are you doing, why are you walking? Why are you breaking the Sabbath? No, I'm going to be like, what? It's amazing. This is marvelous. This is incredible. Praise God that you are now been restored and made whole. And yet, these leaders were more concerned about somebody breaking their rules that they had instituted, and Christ was taking them on. And we see that in the scriptures. In Mark 3, the man with a withered hand, this is what's remarkable. Again, he entered the synagogue, and the man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. Who put that idea in their head? Jesus did, right, in his ministry. He doesn't have to heal on the Sabbath. He chose to every time that he chose to do that. He did it with purpose and intent. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or harm, to save a life or to kill? I love Jesus' question. Because the Pharisees, what are they going to do with that? Right? What are they going to do with that statement? But they, they were silent as he asked this question. So they looked around at them with anger and grieved at the hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and was restored. The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him. How they could possibly destroy him. Right? So the, there's this idea that he's asking them poignant questions. Is it, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Even you will pull a donkey out of the ditch, right? On that particular day. And again, it creates silence because no one can answer your questions. Because how much more valuable is this man than that donkey that he pulled out of that ditch? In Luke 14, one Sabbath when he went, went to dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully again. And behold, there was a man with him who had dropsy. It's a form of edema or swelling. And Jesus responded to the, to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And again, they could not reply to these things. 
See, they were turning the Sabbath into something that it was never intended to be. The, the, the intention of the Sabbath was that, that you might rest and marvel in God and what he had done and what he had accomplished. The fact that God, the creator of the universe, upholds everything. And God does not cease to work on the Sabbath. He took a rest to look off. We know by the providence of God, he upholds the entire universe every second of every day. He cannot not be God. He has to be God. But for his purposes, he set aside this day of rest. That doesn't mean that he still wasn't upholding the universe. And this is what Jesus is calling them to account on. In John 7, the Jews again. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. And the Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it? This is early on, right? How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? He's never studied because he's the author of it all, right? He's the creator. Didn't need to. He's the incarnate Jesus, sent forth by his Father in heaven. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. Boy, he's taking them on, right? But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent me is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answers, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work. This was after the, the Feast of the 5,000. I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision um, and, and from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry because on the Sabbath I made a whole man's whole body well? Do not judge by the appearances, but judge with right judgment. Again, the healings that had taken place, the fact that he healed an invalid man, the fact that he was doing any of these types of healing, isn't that have much more value of what's going on? You circumcise on the eighth day, no matter when that falls, even on the Sabbath, and yet you're okay with that. But it was never the intention on the Sabbath to not have mercy or to do works of necessity. The whole point was to not have works of commerce or to be able to be enslaved to your job and give people time to focus on the one true thing that matters each week. And that's God and God alone. The word of God does the work of God. And we see how incredible it is for us to know and love him because he is compassionate. He's compassionate about his father's law. He was the fulfillment of that law, and he wanted them to understand that what they were doing, it was turning his sovereign father's purpose of the Sabbath into something it was never intended to be. Because they were doing anything but resting in God. They liked their control over the people. They liked the rules and regulations that were there and being hooked up to. We see that in the question of this man who was healed. Do you want to be well? You know what? Some people don't want to be well. They don't want their condition to change. It might have been a way that they've got money by begging or doing other things, and they know nothing else. When we get saved, it is an incredible journey. We are a new creation and can live rightly. And we need the Word of God to continue to teach us and work forward. In Colossians 2.16, we are told that therefore let no one pass judgment on you on questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. When he's talking to the people that were now coming to Christ and they were still holding on to the law and Judaism. And he was saying, no, I'm the fulfillment of those things. And it's okay that one keeps a day holy or even a Sabbath or all these festivals. And you can go ahead and do that. But it's not just rules and regulations things that is the, the issue. We want you to understand that I have come to fulfill the Sabbath. And you may enter into my rest because of that. I am Lord of the Sabbath. In Matthew 12, 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The very thing that they were trying to do to attain righteousness, the Lord of that Sabbath, was in their midst and they knew it not. We see this incredible time of the Sabbath. We talked about that before because, uh, you know, even the religious leaders in the Old Testament, 
Or have you not read in the law in Matthew 12 on the Sabbath how the priests in the temple did not profane uh, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have mentioned, oh, uh, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Um, again, we see these incredible things of them being able to work through it. That was talking about David when he was uh, when he was hungry, and those were with him. How he entered the God, um, the house of God, and ate the bread of the presence, right? And that was not lawful necessarily to do on the Sabbath, but he was not condemned for that. And we see that the religious leaders on the Sabbath that were often performing services were actually sometimes worked twice as hard on the Sabbath for the sacrifices and the things that they were doing. And that was not considered to be work, and they were not profane in that. Praise God that we are able to enter into his rest and his presence and to see just how powerful these things are. Jesus continues to, to blow my mind with story after story of being compassionate. And as we head into the last portion of what we've talked about, we've been talking about his compassion, we've been talking about the truth of the Sabbath, that it's the rest in God and trust in God alone, and that Jesus is the Lord of that Sabbath, and, and how he was coming into the world to proclaim the truth that the Father had always intended, and he was going to correct as he saw fit, according to the Father. And now we're going to head into the idea that Jesus made no bones about who he was. He was God incarnate. He was the Son of God, and he took that on. As I was preparing for this, I saw in Cynthia's office as I was fixing her computer this morning, she had a verse posted, and it talked about the compassion of the Lord. Psalm 103, 8 and 10, the Lord is compassionate. You see that about Jesus, right? The Lord is compassionate, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserves or repay us according to our iniquity. Praise God for that, right? Amen. That he doesn't deal with us according to our sin, but yet set his son in the world to abolish that sin and to put us to death forever that we might know him. What the Jewish leaders were doing was incomprehensible. And it went against the very truth of Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28. When Jesus came in, came for this purpose. Here's what he said. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal them. Come to me, all who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The what the religious leaders were doing was anything but light and easy. It was burdensome, and it was not what God intended. God intended for people on that day to rest in him, not to kill themselves following a bunch of rules that could never bring them salvation. He is the God of salvation. Salvation belongs not to the rules. Salvation belongs to our God. The rules and the laws were set up to bring us to him, to give us a need for him. And it's powerful, and it is good. We know in Jesus' ministry that often he was very choice with his words. But yet, make no mistake about it, he never wavered in who he was. The fact that he was the Son of God, that he was the would-be Messiah, he chose who he revealed that to, and sometimes in places that surprise us, right? But he has the authority to do all things, and he never backed away from that. In the text, we see that the Jews on the Sabbath day were just upset with him. We also see that the man that was healed, Jesus went away from. He did not want to make a scene at that time, and he's going to come back to him in his compassion. He said to take up his bed and walk, and later on he found him, right? Didn't really explain to him what was going on at that time, but came back to him in private. He found the man again, and what did he say to him? Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him again, 
The man did his due diligence. He went to the temple. Sabbath day, you go to the temple. Jesus found him there. He says to him, see that you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Isn't that an incredible thing? Yep. This man has been in England for 30 years. What could be worse than that? What could be worse than that is that you are dead in your sins. Right? That you have no hope. And yet, if we're honest, the world would like to have healings and miracles happen to them. And not be as impressed with God saying your sins are forgiven. Which is more valuable to you? Having your circumstance change? Being healed? Or recognizing the power of which Christ says to you, your sins are forgiven. Go on and sin no more. What an incredible thing, no matter what your situation, right? You can have the whole world. Just give me Jesus. Right? Give me Jesus. Because he is the creator of this world, and he is the object of its glory. The Father in heaven is that powerful and that wonderful and that great, and he's going to bring us to him. Have you been coming to church for a long period of time and not have your eyes open to the truth? Have you stood in the midst of the truth of the word of God and like the Pharisees have turned it into something that it shouldn't be? There's good news for you. Open your eyes that you might hear the power of the gospel. That you might have the power of God open your eyes to the truth. That you might too come and worship him. Notice that he tells this man to sin no more. And the man immediately went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. So unbonded were they to this system that he went back and told. We hear nothing else of this man, but we know that the result is the same. Christ's message is to come into the world and tell you that I have forgiven you and go on and sin no more. And the only way that we can is if we are regenerated. That God opens our eyes to that truth and draws us near. Jesus is not ashamed of who he is. He is the very Son of God. And he says in, in John 5.30 about himself, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another. We're almost finished. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that bears about me is true. You sent John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony I receive is from man, but I say these things that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his life. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think in them that you might have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus taking on these leaders of this time, telling them all those things. Look, if you would believe what God had said, you would believe in me. Powerful, isn't it? But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how then will you believe my words? From the very beginning, everything that these Jews, the Judaizers, were teaching was meant to proclaim Jesus, this eventual path. And you learned ones of Israel, you should have known. And yet... The Lord God is seeing fit to reveal it to the very needy and unlikely people of the world. It's good news for you and me, right? Amen. I hope that your heart will be encouraged by the compassion of Jesus. By the day of rest that he gave us on the Sabbath. The true meaning of the Sabbath was to 
to have all your treasure in God and to enjoy him forever. That we may come to this place and to celebrate and to recognize the provision and providence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God the Father gave him the perfect plan to come into this world to save you and I. I pray for that miracle for you today. I could pray for healing. I could pray for those other things, and they're good. And you know what? We should pray for them. But what we pray more is that your faith might be open, that your eyes might be open to the truth, that you may be called from darkness of sin and death into his marvelous life to the accomplished work of Christ. So we, too, can rejoice. So in closing, I was very blessed to be able to get through that. As I mentioned, I was quite a, a stressful week, but I really was able to enter into the rest of God. And I can tell that people pray for us. I think Pastor Ken as well when you're preaching, just to know that you're able to endure and keep clarity of thought on the Word of God alone. I appreciate your, your prayers, and as a body, I think that we can see the incredible compassion of Jesus Christ. I love the fact that Jesus knows what we need before we need it. That his questions cut to the quick of what our situation might be about. It is not a compassion that just says, oh, you're okay. You're going to be okay. No. He deals with your infirmity. He heals you. And he tells you to walk rightly. He empowers you to be able to do what is right. It's not just a coming alongside. It's a healing. It is a changing. And it's instantaneous and it's powerful. The Sabbath ought to be remembered as a, a glorious day of recognizing our true rest in God. May we see him high and lifted up, and may we come to this place and worship all the more as the day approaches. Amen. And may we make no mistake about it. Jesus is the Son of God, who came to do the Father's will, to die on a tree. And it wasn't the Jews that put him there. It was his Father's plan. It was providentially in store for Christ to redeem for himself a people. It says in the scripture that He's going to lose none of those who the Father gives to him. That's good news. That ought to propel us to go out and tell the world about this good news, that others too might worship him and open their eyes to the truth and go on and sin no more. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful this morning for your lessons of compassion, that Jesus can come to us and open our eyes to your truth. I pray that anybody who's sitting here is like that man who was paralyzed for that amount of time, and yet and, and, and just a proclamation of your word was healed. I pray that somebody today who might be struggling with that, that their eyes might be open to the truth, and your Holy Spirit might open their eyes and quicken them to see you for who you really are. We remember that day when you opened our eyes, Lord, and we are grateful. May your compassion abound all the more as the day approaches. Father, be with us now as we recognize your sovereignty in all things. We thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ. Give us the strength to proclaim his name to all the nations that they too might be saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Eric. Let's stand and be dismissed by singing number 809. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.